Hi everyone, I hope you're all well. So, in the wake of the fourth Democratic presidential debate, the world is wondering just how these candidates stack up against Donald Trump. Well, if you pay attention to the media and their relentless anti-Trump propaganda, it looks like he doesn't have a hoop in hell. However, amidst all the media hostility, Moody's Analytics has released a report that might give the nonpartisan observer a bit of a shock. According to Moody's, Donald Trump could win 2020 in an electoral college landslide, gaining 380 electoral college votes to just 158 to the Democrats, depending on the voter turnout. And if anyone is wondering at the credibility of Moody's analytics, they've been doing these election reports for decades and have only been wrong once, which was 2016. But look, most people got that wrong and Moody's have updated their methodology accordingly, so we'll forgive them. According to Moody's, if turnout is low, Trump will likely win with that huge 380 number. If the turnout meets the historical average, he would still win by a distance, although not as dramatically. The only scenario when Moody's has the Democrats winning is if turnout is the historical maximum, and even then it's only by a tiny squeak of 279 electoral college votes to 259. So, how can all of this be the case, considering the hate Trump gets from the media and the noisy Democrats? I mean, it's quite remarkable, considering that, according to the Media Research Center, as of October last year, 92% of the media coverage of Trump was negative, which would be appropriate if Trump did bad stuff 92% of the time, but any normal, non-hysterical person can see that is clearly not the case. But the thing is, all this negative media coverage is all very, very personal with not a lot of depth. I mean, sure, the cries of Orange Man Bad, Russia Gate, Ukraine Gate, Racist, Sexist, Bigot, etc. have been very persistent for the past four years. However, for all of the media and the Democrats talk about how Trump is a fascist dictator, which they started doing way back in 2015 when he became the nominee, what they have been saying does not match what's actually been happening. Trump is simply not behaving like the second coming of Mussolini that the mainstream media and the Democrats promised. There are no segregation policies for anyone that's not white, there's no Muslim registry, there are no armies of racists roaming the streets terrorizing unsuspecting citizens, women are not forced to be back in the kitchen or ostracized from the workforce. <laughs> All those things they dog whistled and hinted at and actually sometimes explicitly mentioned are simply not there. Instead, the USA is doing really well. And while the Democrats keep trying to puff up alleged scandals, come on, most people really don't care beyond a superficial level. And he's an angel compared to the Clintons, which everyone knows. And while there are polls floating around that say about 52% of people want Trump impeached, well, What's new? That pretty much exactly mirrors the percentage of people who didn't vote for him in 2016, a block of people who are notoriously vengeful and take politics very personally. Like, honestly, Trump could cure cancer single-handedly and those people would say he was taking jobs away from doctors and cancer researchers. So, your average person looks at the media and at these Democrat politicians, compares what they're saying to what's actually going on, and thinks, hang on a minute, perhaps I've been lied to. Hence the fact confidence in the mainstream media is at an all-time low. But this departure from reality and the disinformation spread by the media and by Democrat politicians tells only 50% of the story. Donald Trump himself obviously plays a huge part in why Moody's has been able to make these predictions. It's also why, even in the face of relentless histrionic negative coverage, Trump's approval rating has remained reasonably stable throughout his presidency. Not overwhelmingly high, but stable. While the Democrats are busy talking about a partisan and pointless impeachment initiative and fear-mongering about the end of the world, Trump is out there on the campaign trail already, most notably his stellar rally in Minnesota last week. Our bold pursuit of this pro-American agenda has enraged, and you know what's happened? It's enraged the failed ruling class in Washington. Not easy to get them out, but we're doing it slowly but surely. So now the Democrats are making a pathetic bid to save Sleepy Joe, Sleepy Joe Biden. And you know what? I'd love to run against him, to be honest. Anybody like that, if you can't beat him in a debate, you got a big problem, folks. I love the cops, but let's do another T-shirt. Where's Hunter? Where is he? And your father was never considered smart. 
He was never considered a good senator. He was only a good vice president because he understood how to kiss Barack Obama's. Do you remember the evening that we won? I think, look, forgetting me, I think it was one of all of us together because we all worked hard. I was the messenger, but we all worked hard. That was our victory, not my victory. Most of the Democrats four years ago, they wanted a wall. Now all of a sudden, they don't want a wall. You know why they don't want a wall? Because I want it. It's the only reason. And I just thought of it, you know, like a year ago. I said, man, this could have been so much easier. All I had to do is say, we don't want a wall, and they would have given me all the financing I wanted for the wall. Here you've got a man who is brash, a bit naughty, brimful of charisma and oh so witty, who doesn't do the political speak of establishment politicians. That is what ordinary people dig and it is what helped Trump win in 2016. He also doesn't shy away from calling himself a billionaire. He's happily owned that since 2015. Here's the good news. I'm very rich. I don't need anybody's money. It's nice. I'm really rich. I'm the most successful person ever to run. Fortunately, I'm very rich. So I have a total net worth, and now with the increase, it'll be well over $10 billion. I'm not doing that to brag, because you know what? I don't have to brag. I don't have to, believe it or not. This is a wise tactic, because let's be real, there is nothing worse than a super rich politician trying to pretend they're just like ordinary working people. And for all you Australians out there, Instead, Trump uses his vast wealth to represent his track record of business success and never treats having money like it's a bad thing. This is because he is appealing to the aspirational voter who is chasing the American dream, the average citizen with big hopes and bold plans for the future and dreams of success financially and personally. That is not the kind of person who is wooed by class, envy, or demonizes anyone on above average income, or is in favor of taxing the wealthy to the back teeth. It is the opposite of the eat the rich complex. The aspirational voter likes Trump because Trump is a winner. Americans love winners, which is why he goes on about winning all the time. We're going to keep winning and winning and winning and winning, remember? The key to Trump's rhetoric is that it's simple, it's concise, and above all else, it's uplifting. It's galvanizing. It makes people want to work and strive and dream and succeed. It makes people feel good about themselves. I mean, look at his 2016 shtick. It was basically... We are going to rebuild this country. I'm going to put you all to work and a good job to do it. And together, we're going to make America great again. And he has continued with that apparently winning strategy in his 2020 campaign with Keep America Great. It is so unassumingly powerful. It gives a sense of identity without being identitarian and speaks to the individual rather than the collective. Now compare this to the other side. While Trump was rallying in Minnesota to critical acclaim, the Democrats were holding an LGBT town hall in Los Angeles hosted by CNN. And while I am a big advocate for LGBT people, honestly, holding an LGBT town hall, especially in hyper-left Los Angeles, is not what you would think a vote winner, considering they are very much preaching to the converted. The Democrats already have most of the LGBT vote, and despite how prolific LGBT issues are in popular culture, it's actually a very niche thing. Only about 4.5% of the U.S. population identifies as LGBT, according to Gallup, so this kind of event is likely not going to really interest your average American or your on-the-fence Trump voter, at least not on a vote-winning level. Particularly when the centerpiece was... CNN, you have erased black trans women for the last time. Let me tell you something. Black trans women are dying. Our lives matter. I'm an extraordinary black trans woman, and I deserve to be here. My black trans sisters that are here, I am tired. I am so tired. I'm just sitting there, and it's not just my black trans women, it's my black trans brothers, too. And I'm going to say what I'm going to say. I'm going to say what no, I'm going to say. No, 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 come here. No, no, I just want to ask you something. Come I'm, here. I'm Tell me. Saying, come here. I want you to talk. What's your name? I'm Blossom C. Brown. Blossom. Look. Anyway, this decision pretty much sums up the schmozzle that is the Democrats' apparent election strategy. Preach to the converted, focus on stuff that is beyond the realm of Twitter niche, and relentlessly scream, orange man, bad. And just look at the candidates. With the exception of a couple, they're 
kind of terrible. None of them really stand out as the kind of person who could take on Donald Trump. And yes, while most of them are polling ahead of Trump by decent margins, well, so what? Hillary Clinton was polling ahead of Trump in nearly every poll for the entirety of the 2016 campaign, and she still didn't win. Just because someone prefers one individual over another on a personal level doesn't mean they're necessarily going to vote for them. Anyway, the Democrats as a party don't seem to have a unified issue that they want to stake the election on. Trump, on the other hand, has very clear election winning policies and they are very mainstream. The economy, border protection, immigration, jobs, personal freedom. This is stuff that affects everyone and that therefore everyone can easily get behind. Now, if it was me strategizing the Democrats' big election issues, well, I would stake it on health care. Certainly, the candidates are talking about it, but some of their proposed policies, namely those of Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, are so far to the left that they alienate a significant chunk of people. According to, again, Gallup poll, 54% of Democrat voters want their party to move rightwards towards the center. This is opposed to only 41% who want the party to be more left-wing. So why on earth are Bernie and Elizabeth and others pushing for a further leftwards swing? I get the want for universal health care. I come from a country where we have universal health care and not one single person, left wing or right wing, in the public discourse has any complaints about its existence. But Warren and Bernie's idea of abolishing all health insurance and forcing everyone onto a government funded Medicare for all scheme is further to the left even than Australia. We have a very good balance of private and public health cover and it works extremely well. This of course came up during the last debate, namely how you pay for it. Senator Warren, to be clear, Senator Sanders acknowledges he's going to raise taxes on the middle class to pay for Medicare for all. You've endorsed his plan. Should you acknowledge it too? So the way I see this, it is about what kinds of costs middle class families are going to face. So let me be clear on this. Costs will go up for the wealthy, they will go up for big corporations, and for middle class families, they will go down. What's your response? Well, we heard it tonight, a yes or no question that didn't get a yes or no answer. At least Bernie's being honest here and saying how he's gonna pay for this and that taxes are gonna go up. And I'm sorry, Elizabeth, but you have not said that. And I think we owe it to the American people to tell them where we're gonna send the invoice. Costs aren't taxes, Elizabeth. Then there are the other policies and issues that they seem to think are going to win over your average voter, like, well, open borders, identity politics, and race baiting. Now, I'm gonna, we're gonna, gonna get to you, hang on. We're gonna get to you. stage, I would well, like to speak I, I, on the issue of race. Gender neutral bathrooms and the constant moralizing about how rich people are evil and everyone except white people is oppressed and how women's rights are allegedly under attack, which uh, they're not, by the way. It's moralizing as opposed to galvanizing, which is what Trump does. Nobody likes a moral lecture, but everyone loves a pep talk. Plus, the Democratic candidates continue to propagate the raging climate change alarmism, which we are all so sick of. And of course, who could forget this? A lot of you have been talking tonight about these government health care plans that you've proposed. Raise your hand if, gover if your government plan would provide coverage for undocumented immigrants. In a country that doesn't provide government-funded universal health care for its own citizens, how could they think people would dig the idea of providing government-funded health care for illegal immigrants? Like, how do you make that leap? Then, of course, there's the screechy cries of impeach, 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 even though in order for Trump to be actually removed from office, 20 Republicans in the Senate will have to flip, which is, of course, highly unlikely. And as a continuing chorus of hysteria, there is the relentless fear mongering that Trump and his supporters are all racist, sexist, white supremacist bigots. Newsflash. Thanks to leftists chronically overusing those words, they have lost all significance. Nobody other than them cares if someone's called racist, etc. anymore because the gravity of that accusation has been diluted to the point of it being meaningless. Democrats have learned nothing from 2016. Their strategy of polished politician speak plus policy vagaries plus orange man bad, which did not win them the last election, is for some reason the same strategy they're employing now. 
All of this can perhaps explain why Moody's Analytics has made this very, very interesting prediction. As for me, I'm not making any predictions at all. I try very hard not to do that when it comes to elections. After 2016, anything could happen. But at least you Americans can control the outcome if you get yourselves to the ballot box. If you liked that video, please remember to like, subscribe, share, leave me a comment. And if you really, really liked it, then check out the video description for my Subscribestar link and other ways you can support me. Mm -hmm.